present a really exciting national panel called The Rise of Hate and the Systems that Promote It. Uh, I am Brenda Siegel. I'm running for Lieutenant Governor here in Vermont. I'm really excited that we have attendees from all over the country and our panelists are also from all over the country, uh, though our attendees are coming from also California and other places as well. So we're very excited. Uh, and uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists. I'm actually going to let them introduce themselves. We have a really incredible panel here of people who are experienced, uh, le both legislators and activists, and with lived experience. And we're ready to talk about uh, not just that there's always been hate or that hate has risen in the last four years, but that there has that it has been there since the beginning and the system was designed that way. And so uh, we, it's time for us to talk about it in a more real way going forward. So uh, I'll start with um, my good friend and, uh, and just one of my favorite local activists, Mia Schultz. Hi, thank you, Brenda, for having me. I knew you were gonna start with me, I, but it's okay. I'll be brief. Um, you know, I appreciate being invited here. You know, I always say, you know, I'm not, I'm an insurance, I'm an insurance adjuster, I don't do this. But, you know, I was called to, to, to be a voice for the voiceless um, just, by, just by pure moving to Vermont about five years ago. Um, I came from uh, by way of, of Arizona and California myself and just kind of like started noticing some really disgusting transgressions being committed against um, people of color, including my children. And so I had to step up. I had the courage of, in a town that, whose culture is, 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 has been um, promoted to stay silent. I, I was able to use my voice. Um, so here we are today and, and we'll, I'm, I'm excited to be amongst all these, um, all these wonderful colleagues. So um, thank you for having me, Brenda. Thank you, Mia, and thank you so much for coming. And your voice is extremely important. You are not just an insurance adjuster. I have heard you speak on this issue many times, and you are an incredible force. Uh, so uh, next, we'll go to Camilla. And I'm not sure I'm saying your name right, but Camilla Williams, who is coming from Chicago, I believe. And yes. yes. Yes, I am. So thank you guys for having me on this uh, panel. Um, yes, I am from Chicago. Uh, I wear many hats. Not only am I um, an advocate, an activist, I am an educator, and I'm also elected to a trustee position. So I have a mixture of seeing all sides of pretty much everything. Uh, my key passion is preventing violence, whether it's through hate, policing, all forms of violence. Um, I've been impacted by violence. I lost 34 loved ones to senseless acts of violence these past 17 years, and I just want to do something to make it stop. So thank you again. Thank you so much. And I, I'm so honored that you're joining us today. So thanks. Thank you for having me. Um, I am now going to go over to another one of my friends and, uh, in, and also an incredible force artist and activist, Amber Arnold. Hello, my name's Amber. Um, I'm an activist and artist, and I own a studio in Brattleboro, Vermont. Um, I do a lot of consulting work and have a lot of interest looking at the ways that white supremacy and racism are just all encompassing like the air that we breathe and all of the ways that that perpetuates the system of, of hate and really looking at the ways that we can shift that culture. Thanks, Amber, and I'm so glad you got to join us today. Uh, and I'd like to, I'm gonna shift over to Alma Hernandez just in case she has to pop back and forth. Um, she's currently in session in the legislature in Arizona, unfortunately has been called in se to session and in person. So we're really grateful that you're here as well. Thank you, I appreciate it. It's an honor to be with all these panelists. I know you all, you're all very amazing people and you're doing great work in your state. So thank you for all you do. Um, first and foremost, my name is Alma Hernandez, and I'm a state representative here in, in Arizona, so I represent the district where I was born and raised. 
Um, I come from a very interesting background. Um, I'm both Hispanic and I'm also Jewish. Um, and I'm very proud of my roots and I'm very proud of who I am. Um, but I've also faced a lot of a lot of different difficult circumstances throughout my life. Um, I was a victim of police brutality and I've been very outspoken and that's one of the reasons why I ran for office. Um, I also have been a victim of a lot of hate because of being Jewish. And it's been a very difficult thing because coming from a state like Arizona where Hispanics uh, sometimes were treated like second class citizens, it made it very difficult um, being hated for many reasons. Um, but that's something that I've been uh, working against and working towards fixing the last few years. Um, now that I'm in the legislature, I've um, introduced bills that would, would help our community. Um, I've introduced bills to ensure that we're training police officers and holding them accountable. I'm very proud to have the support of a Republican governor on that one. Um, after sharing my personal story, I was able to accomplish that. So I'm very grateful to be with you all and I appreciate the work that each and every one of you do in your communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, and I really do think that when you have lived experience, there is a, a, a level that you can actually um, get support from people who aren't always um, and when you're in those positions of power, which is why it's so important that people with lived experience end up in positions of power, because it's the only way to really uh, bridge those gaps, I think, sometimes. I'd love to welcome also Representative Chevron Jones from Florida, and uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thank you so much, Brenda, for having me, and uh, it's such a pleasure to be on here with uh, such esteemed individuals. Uh, women, to be exact, yeah, and so thank you all for uh, for this opportunity. My name is Chevron Jones, and I uh, hail from South Florida, Miami, um, to be exact. I've never been to Vermont, but I guess this is as close as I'm going to get to it. It's okay, uh, but I will say that um, it's such a pleasure to be here. I've been in the legislature now for uh, for eight years. Um, I'm on my last my last term. Uh, I turned out, but I'm now running for the state senate, District 35. Uh, my, the work that I have done within the legislature over the past eight years have been social justice focused. Um, my freshman year in the legislature, I filed uh, the police body camera bill so for state to go statewide, um, which which I thought was a, would be an uphill battle. Uh, but I truly believe that when you bring people into your community and to your world to share your experience, uh, I think it, it it can change policies. Uh, because then you put racism and you put disparities on display. Uh, and so, which I'm uh, happy that you know, we were able to pass that in the state of Florida. I'm looking forward to this conversation that um, today, uh, because I believe the only way to be able to deal with racism is to expose it. So uh, I'm looking forward to, forward to us having this conversation today. And again, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, I am, again, Brenda Siegel. I'm running for Lieutenant Governor. Uh, I uh, was a victim of a hate event just recently um, and, and have found out that I'm likely a target. Uh, and uh, where Zoom bombers came and store the, stole the screen and drew swastikas while we were at a forum. Uh, and they did it twice during the event. Uh, and, uh, and we just kept going pretty much like nothing had happened. Uh, and it was quite jarring for, for me. And, uh, and also it's very different to be running for office uh, with that fear umbrella happening as well. Uh, but I've been really saying out loud that what I really, this has brought to me is that I am not wearing my difference on my skin. And so I don't uh, experience it the same way every single day and black and brown folks are experiencing it every single day that same way. Uh, so while, it, while I have experienced anti-Semitism, especially since I, when I spoke out um, in, uh, for uh, Kaya Morris, who was harassed by a white local white supremacist and a few people, um, I became then the target of him for a brief time, but I, it's not the same as the, as the experience that others are having and folks that wear it on their skin. So I think that th this conversation has to be had with that lens in mind, uh, even when, but I'm, not that we don't need to talk about all of it, we do, but, uh, but it has to have that lens. So I'm really excited that you have all joined us. And now we're just gonna go through and we're gonna 
uh, talk a little more in detail about where you come from, the work that you've done, and where you think that we need to go from here right now. Uh, and uh, and you know whatever whatever your work, if if you're wanting to talk about uh, even just the system, that's also fine too. Uh, with I always say with the lens that the system is people made and people made problems can be people fixed. So I'll start with Alma Hernandez, Representative Alma Hernandez. Yes, thank you. And I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So the work that I've been doing over the years has really been centered around my lived experiences and really the experiences of many brown and, and black communities in my in my state. Um, you know, I come from an area where we're predominantly Hispanic and Latino. Sorry, can you all hear me with this? Because it's so annoying, but I refuse to take it off in this building. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but we have his, the Hispanic and Latinos are the majority. Um, we call it ma majority minority because we're still minorities, but we're a big majority of the state. Um, we also have a, a very large, significant presence of Native American, and we, we have a smaller presence of African American and Black communities here in Arizona. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of us face a lot of the very similar um, issues, unfortunately, um, that have continued to follow us for years. Um, in Arizona, a state that has been known for being very racist, um, a state that has been known for doing things that many times don't actually help our, our communities. And putting us backwards. And that's really one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about the work that I do. When I was running for office, um, it was very difficult for me as well, Brenda. And I'll tell you that you need, a, you need to be very confident of who you are and not allow any of that to stop you from your mission. Because when I ran David Duke, who I'm sure you all know who that is, um, targeted me in my race. And that was a very difficult thing, you know, to hear from the Southern Poverty Law Center that they were monitoring the situation um, and that, you know, if I needed anything to please feel free to reach out. For me, that was difficult because here I was being the youngest woman running in the legislature, um, running up against the establishment because that's what it was for me. Um, and really then having to deal outside of all of that, deal with the, the situation outside, which was a lot of hate for being who I am. And it was very difficult. I'm not going to lie and sugarcoat it and say that it was an easy thing, but it was a difficult journey, and I will say that it's one that I don't regret. Um, at the end of the day, I think that we need people like myself who are willing to be outspoken and be passionate about the work that we do um, to be able to uplift and protect others in our communities. Um, sharing my story about how I was brutally attacked by a police officer as a 14-year-old um, at my high school was not the easiest thing to do. Um, sharing why I suffer from severe spinal damage and, uh, and, and um, nerve damage to the left side of my body has not been an easy thing to have conversations on. But if it took that, if everything that I've endured, I had to use that and turn it into a positive. And that's why I was able to share my story with even those people I thought would never agree with me on this issue. Um, they, they truly felt, you know, when I expressed myself and told them why I was so passionate, I was able to get a million dollars in the budget to ensure training for police officers in Arizona. I was able to make it mandatory that school, that officers who are working on our school campuses are properly trained to work with children and adolescents. For me, that was huge. So working, working as, a, as a Democrat in a, in a Republican state, it's sometimes very difficult to pass some of our, our, our agendas and work towards things for the things that we want to see change. But at the end of the day, we have to continue fighting for that. And, and I'm sure in Florida, it's probably very similar, <laughs> um, but it, it's a difficult thing. And we have to continue fighting and being the voice in our community because if we don't do it, honestly, it's very difficult. If we're not the ones advocating for ourselves, it's hard enough to get us to do it. We're not gonna be able to get just anyone off the street to do it for us. So, um, you know, it's, it's difficult. Two things that I worked on, one was mandatory Holocaust education in Arizona. Um, it got through the House and the Senate, and now it's stuck in the Senate because they've signy died and we're still apparently working. Um, so my bill is basically dead at this point, which is, which is unfortunate. But part of the reason why, and I tell people all the time, is learning about the Holocaust is very important. It's history that should never be repeated. And I know that there have been many instances and many other genocides and, and things of that nature that we all need to talk about. But when we talk about what's going on in our country right now and the rise of anti-Semitism, 
and we look at the history and if we're not teaching people the history and how we got to that point then we're going to repeat it. We're going to see more hate against Jews, more hate against minorities, more hate against anyone who doesn't look like what they think is normal. Um, so for me, it was very important to push for mandatory Holocaust education, especially when our Holocaust survivors are dying right now. Um, so many of them are so much older that we need to be able to tell their stories now. Um, I also had a bill on anti-Semitism because we don't have a definition in Arizona of what and what classifies as anti-Semitism. And I really, really wanted to push that bill because it goes back to the, if we are not, are, are not highlighting what these things are doing to our communities, it's just gonna continue to happen. So, you know, now that those two bills are unfortunately stuck in the Senate and basically dead, um, I'm going to be bringing them back up next year. And I hope that all of you in the communities that you work in, you're pushing for legislation and change that will help improve our communities. Um, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of us are involved in many different groups and many different, we have our hands in a bunch of different pots trying to help everyone, but we need to continue to fight for what we believe in. And if it doesn't happen the first time, I, need, I know you've been a legislator, what, eight years now? You, you have to keep trying. You have to keep trying. And if it doesn't happen next year, well, I'll run again and it'll happen eventually. So you have to be very positive, um, looking at the future and how you can really create change really is dependent on how invested you are in the issue as well. Thank you so much. And I, I just wanna say that I appreciate the bills that you're putting forth. I've had, a, I, I one, remember one time my son's school, they said something like, um, and, and at one of his schools, they said something like, we're just not gonna teach the Holocaust anymore because we just don't have time for all that. And I was very frustrated by it because I think that that's where the risk comes in in repeating the history. Uh, and also as someone I've my what I mostly have advocated for is economic justice and racial justice issues as interconnected as well as uh, climate as it connects but also in the last two years opioid issues as someone who's lost two young family members my nephew uh, who uh, my nephew who died two years ago uh, and he was the son of my brother who died just over 20 years ago. And so um, I was really engaged in his upbringing. And so I've, that lived ex fighting that lived experience and telling those stories is extremely hard. Um, and especially when it's ignored or fall on falls on deaf ears and having and getting up, living to fight another day on it uh, is really difficult. So thank you so much for, for continuing to do that work. Um, and I am gonna, I just am randomly choosing you. So I am gonna go to Representative Chevron Jones Next. I appreciate that. I appreciate Representative Hernandez for um, uh, for sharing sharing the bills that you that you have filed. Uh, you know, I, I, let me start off with this: that uh, a lot of times people make the, make the statement, as far as especially in politics, that representation matters, and that is actually true. Uh, myself, representing an eighty-two percent district of African Americans, um, uh, and. It, excuse me, 82% black and brown district, African-American, Hispanic, uh, representation, representation does matter. But I've also figured out in, in the legislature uh, in, is that in politics period, that just because they're your, uh, your color doesn't mean that they're your kind. And we have often find, found that out in politics because people get into office, they join the Black Caucus and they join all these things um, and use the statement that because I'm Black, I need to put forth a Black agenda, but behind the scenes, that's not what they're promoting, right? Uh, and so let me start off by saying that because a lot of times that we get into office and we see the issues and we elected officials are scared to put forth legislation that, that will directly benefit their communities. And until we get to a place where we start putting people in office who are unequivocally going to put forth legislature, that legislation that when they go back to their districts, that they can say that the seat that you have given me at the table has not been wasted, we will continue to have these conversations over and over again 
until we can put the right people in office who will be able to call out hate, who can call out anti-Semitism, who can call out the various things that's happened to our transgender community, who can call out the things that's happened um, to our incarcerated women and, or, or our incarcerated men. These are like real issues that are truly happening with our, in our communities. But the reason why they keep falling on deaf ears is because people who are elected keep selling out when they get in office. And so that's what we're dealing with right now. And so that's why when I got into the legislature and I filed legislation dealing with police body cameras, I, I didn't have to sugarcoat what I was doing. I did it because black boys were being killed in the street. And so that was my story. That's what I said. And because I wanted them to understand that that was the reason because I have five, I have six nephews. And because I, when I go to Tallahassee, I know what I need to come back and show them that I'm representing not just them, but the other, other black boys and the other Hispanic boys who are not respected and are looked at as uh, um, at the N word and the S words when, from, uh, when, when they come back into their communities. Uh, I, wasn't, I was very clear that when I filed dignity for incarcerated women, I know who are, who's incarcerated. I know it's our black men and our black women who are mostly incarcerated. And I know that they treat our incarcerated men and women as if they're second-class citizens when they are really human beings who have just made bad decisions, right? And, and, and so my thing has always been that if I'm going to sit in this seat, and if I'm going to be in any type of representation, that I'm going to make sure that I put forth policies that's going to come back and help my community. Because at the end of the day, after the politics is done, I still got to go back on the same street I was raised in, and the people are going to ask me, what did you do to help me? And if I can't say that I fought on your behalf, that I fought for your child, or I fought for your grandchild, I wasted a seat. And that's why we have to continue to put people in office like Representative Hernandez and make sure we have advocates uh, like Amber and like Camila and like Mia to call these things out, not be afraid to do it, and not only just do it within their cities, make sure it makes a resounding noise across the country to make everyone know that I'm not scared to fight for my blackness. I'm not scared to fight for me as a Hispanic. I'm not scared to fight for me as a Jew. And until we get there, we'll continue having these conversations. And so my policies in Florida, I know where we are at in Florida. I know we are in a Republican-ran legislature. I get the fact that they are not too keen on um, putting forth issues that are important to my community. But what you would never say is that Chevron Jones did not go to Tallahassee and fight like hell on the behalf of the people in his district and in his state. But and, and know this, me fighting for my people don't even mean that I'm not going to fight for yours. Because as, if you're my ally, and if you, if you really truly are my ally, just like I fight like hell for you, I want it back in return. But don't let me show up for you when you're going to show up for me. And that's the one thing that we have to continuously call out and talk about in these policy positions, in these policy conversations, and even for the people who sit at the table making these decisions. And so that's what I'm happy we have in this conversation. I put forth my legislation that I've done uh, in that entire thread that I just made mention of, but I just had to make sure I make it clear that you I mean while we're having these conversations and to the, the people who are listening to this conversation, you know, making sure that you hold your elected officials accountable, not coming back and bringing breadcrumbs and you go and when they come home, they eating the breadcrumbs themselves and not leaving it for the people to eat. That's the problem that we're having on the streets. And that's the type of stuff we got to keep calling out and make sure we put people in office who going to make sure that they not only call it out, but they stand up for what they say they believe in. Well, I'm all charged up now, for real. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take actually a lot for me, but that definitely did it. Uh, and uh, so, I, yeah, I mean, I want to say that I just want to grab onto that one thing that you said, where if I show up for you, I want you to show up for me. And I think that okay. happens a lot for those of us that are out there fighting. We, we fight hard. And then when we, you know, I felt very alone after this attack. Like I, I did not feel like people really reached out to me and I, I show up all the time. And meanwhile, I'm, we're stuck at home. We're sitting ducks right now, if, you, if you're a target. And so I think that when you're, I, I, do, I do think we don't, we don't show up the way, don't call it out every time. And I was given the advice multiple times uh, to not call it out because don't give them any power. I was like, no, I'm done with that because us not calling it out has given them lots of power. We do have to call it out. We do have to speak up. 
that's not, it doesn't work. We've tried that. It doesn't work to play, to play that game. No, but they, they still get the power. So it's, it is time for us to all to stand up and stand up for real and mean it and show up. And even when it's hard, say things that are not necessarily politically popular. So thank you so much for all of that, both of you. Uh, and I am gonna kick it over to Mia. I'm totally out of order now. Thank you, both both of you, Alma and Sherman. I like relate in so many ways and, and I wanna hit some of that thing. Alma, I'm, I'm from Arizona, born and raised Tucson, Arizona, and I was there when when Martin Luther King holiday didn't pass and fought to get that um, fought to get that um, an actual holiday from Martin Luther King when the rest of the country was doing it. Arizona was behind. I was there for when they took ethnic studies out of our out of the schools. I was there when they they showed me your papers laws, and I was fighting all there. And I came here to Vermont, land of Bernie Sanders and the progressives, and, and thought that, you know, it, it can't possibly be that bad here. It, it looks, seems like a great small town. I moved to a small town, Bennington, Vermont. The town has a population of 15,000 people or so. You know, you're at one degree of separation of knowing people. But I found that the culture was so stifled here and because there were so many, so little, so few people of color here that um, they just, that, that people of color were, were just ignored, um, just like they were just, it, it was oblivion. It was oblivion. Um, and so I started asking questions and having, and, and holding people accountable. One of the actions, one of the things that happened um, after a couple of years that it had, other things that happened, but one in particular that was significant where my son was learning about slavery. Now we're talking about the things that they learn in school. It's how they learn it too. So he, he was learning about slavery um, and they asked him to reenact slavery, like to lay down on the floor and pretend to be a slave. And, and that was a big fight that I had to fight to explain why that was wrong. Like why that causes damage and harm to my son and why, that, why that's not, they had been doing that for 14 years. And I was able to advocate for those, advocate and help so that, that they will never teach that in that manner in that school again. But unfortunately, since then, there have been other transition, transgressions in other parts of this, the state. So that it, it still continues. Um, and and I, 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 I'm working on part of the Vermont State Coalition, um, Equity Coalition for Education, where um, legislation was passed to um, help with the standards and discuss and change the standards, or at least add standards, ethnic study standards to our schools, but they're still optional. So my, my purpose for the reason I work is starts with the kids and then it goes to all the systemic things that, that reach, reach within that. And eventually I found that there's like in, enormous injustices happening in our police department here in Bennington. So I started hearing stories of people who, who have been it, marginalized people who have been, um, who had been just, um, not being not only not supported but harassed and 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 just in general harassment and harm being brought to them and then Kaya, Kaya Morris our legislator was forced to resign because um because she was targeted by a white supremacist but that story went deeper and the press it went international this press and they all neglected to to really talk about how that, uh, how that is systemic. It's more than just one man targeted one woman. It's the fact that that woman who is a legislator didn't get protection by the police. She was doubted, she was called racist because, because she wanted protection, because she didn't wanna be, and our attorney general decided at that point that, that hate speech is free speech. 
right? He didn't do anything to try to be, be, be support the people in the community and support Kaya, who he knew. And so we need us to keep holding these legislators and these politicians accountable. I've, I've really asked really tough questions to all of, of the people running for offices. I, I myself haven't been brave enough to go there, but, but asking and making sure that our, that our legislature, all our people who are involved are, are not forgetting the vul most vulnerable in our, in our community and all the things, especially in progressive, areas I like this all the things when we talk about climate justice and we talk about medical and we talk about it all affects our communities of color first and the most we're obviously seeing that from evidence of today and and of what what we're all going to get going through together that it's impacting the people of color the most um so I really appreciate what Chervin said, uh, you know, with, uh, with making sure that we are holding our, our legislators accountable, but also we need to hold all of the people in office who are holding office. And um, so right now we're, we, um, we are in the process of requesting resignation of our police department, um, our police department chief, as well as our town manager, because they have been in power for 30 some years and and they have um, a warrior mentality which has been documented. We have documented statistics on how they how they pull over black people more than than white people. And you know, Vermont, as as white as it may be, has the highest percent percentage of people in prison. The disparities there are amazing considering the um, considering the um, the, the, the amount of white people versus people of color here. So, you know, it, 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 it doesn't, it's not all the, the racism systemic is not exclusive to the South, not exclusive to the West or the North. It's, it's all over. And um, so uh, just, you know, accountability is really how I, I plan on, on going forward. Thank you, Mia, and thanks for all you do. And I think, uh, I think something really uh, that I want to highlight is that we often, when we're looking at uh, who who was who's running for office, we don't dig deep enough. We don't find out has this person been fighting for this? Uh, have they examined their own implicit bias? Have are they willing to stand up in in a way that that is brave, even if it means losing their next election? Uh, like our are they willing to do that? Or is it always gonna be about their next election and their career? Are they willing to, to really stand up for things? Because on the other side, people are doing that. They do stand up for terrible things on, on, far, on the far right. And so we do need to be able to stand up as well on, this, on, on the left, but it's not just the left. It, should be, it shouldn't even be that. That's not what it should be about. And so, I think that that's extremely important. And I want to say about Bennington that one, so I think a lot of people think Vermont is, has no, uh, you know what, I'm going to get into this in a little bit, but I think, I think Vermont pe people think that we must be all good because we got Bernie, but the reality is that uh, we, that we really struggle on some very progressive issues and, and, and in centering the most marginalized people in our state. We really struggle on that with our policy, just like everywhere else. And in some ways worse than everywhere else. So we have to fix that. We have to be willing to own it and work towards it. Uh, so I am now going to introduce again, Camila. Hopefully, am I? Yeah. First, I would like to say to Representative Jones, uh, what you said is so accurate. You are speaking to the very problem why America see the issues that we have in Chicago and Illinois. You know, right now we had uh, 195 homicides and almost 900 people shot, well, 1,000 people shot. And this is only the month of uh, May. So we have a high number of African-American leaders who do not want to press the issue on policies. That's why we see, um, you know, a bunch of gun, uh, gun trafficking. That's why you see a lot of retaliation shootings because we don't have trauma resources in schools. 
that's why you see the police officers not being held accountable. You know, people are forgetting that Jason Van Dyke, who killed Laquan McDonald, will be home next year. He only got 81 months. And it's not because the people didn't protest. It's not because we didn't go to meetings. It's not because we didn't vote. It's because of the gatekeeping of our elected officials who are afraid to push forth policy. I was actually offended that so many elected officials chose to run for a mob instead of running to their computers, looking at the policies that's already in the legislative and saying that we're gonna push these policies. No one really did that, but they wanted to say how they are mother. Did anybody know that Mike Brown was supposed to turn 24 years old on yesterday? It's been five years and they got a new prosecutor who is black, used his death and told his father that I have not got around to seeing if I'm gonna reopen up the case. So part of my job is accountability, civic engagement. I have a youth group that I'm teaching them. After you vote, Get your seat at the table by implementing and pushing for pushing for policy proposals. And you tell them if they don't introduce it and they don't put no backing behind it, they're gonna be gone like we did Anita Alvarez. And anybody else, I don't care what nobody else say, if they do not have your best interest and they look like you, they gotta go. Because I'm tired, I'm a mother of two sons. I lost 34 loved ones, including a grandfather who's a Chicago, a Chicago police officer. So I'm not just talking about the hate that's coming from the police. It's hate that's coming towards the police. And it needs to be addressed. And the only way it's going to get addressed is through these policies, making sure communities that's deprived of resources get the resources that we need. And that's my job. And I'm not, I'm not sugarcoat nothing. I'm not sitting at nobody else's tables who are not trying to move the people for the better of this country. It's so much gatekeeping secretly for this, for some of y'all president, I didn't vote for him right now. It's gatekeeping for him. It's gatekeeping for white supremacy said, but we have to have unity. We have to have unity. No, change these policies to hold them accountable. And that's something that I'm doing in my state, Illinois, I'm pushing policies. Uh, we have police accountability. Um, that um, they just scared. They they just scared. We we I don't know if you guys saw in the media that our new uh, local fraternal order police president just got accolades from Trump, saying that's a good leader. That is so scary. And then I had elected officials that I reached out to, like, did y'all not just see this man? The damage that he's getting ready to allow in the Chicago Police Department, but instead. You want to talk about how you need to remove Trump. No, you got to remove his surrogates too. And that again, that is my main focus is civic engagement, pushing policies and empowering our young people to use their voice. My millennials run for office. I am the youngest elected school board tr uh, trustee in our state and, and even in education, you have a voice to move policies in education because there, that's problems of education too. Not getting the proper resources, not dealing with trauma and everything intersects. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I did just address a question. I want to just say that we are seeing your questions and we are going to have a chance to address them. I did just address one though to take care of it. Um, but there was a question about, uh, you know, someone being sympathetic to it but are we ranting and I was like it wasn't just while you were talking I don't know when it came in but the but my point the reason I'm talking about it right now is because if you're not hearing what the advice and the information is and what each person is saying then you're not listening so I'm asking our attendees to please listen to what is being said right now the experience people are having and what they're asking us all of us to do what all of us are asking all of us to do and what the, how we how we have to examine ourselves. That's extremely important. So uh, I just want to address that also publicly. I, I addressed it in writing and took care of it also that way by, but I, I do want to say for people who are watching, this discussion is extremely important. And if you're a little uncomfortable while we're having it, good. 
this is, we need to be a little uncomfortable. That's, that's the reality of, especially if you're a white person, you're a little uncomfortable having this discussion right now. Great. That's where you need to be. So please stick around and continue to have it. Uh, so I, um, I want to now go to Amber and I think we're going to try to show a, a diagram she has. We may or may not do that well, but we're going to try. It's the first time we've ever tried it. Uh, other questions, we are answering them. If you are someone who's really wants to ask questions, but you're on Facebook Live or YouTube or somewhere else, please do come in to the Zoom meeting and we will, uh, and we will address, uh, we will address questions in the Q&A. Thanks so much. I'm really grateful to like hear everyone on here speak and it feels like just amazing to be in the presence of people like sharing and I really wish all of y'all were in Vermont because it would be nice to have more people like you here. Um, so I live in Vermont, which is the one of the whitest states in the country and it's considered to be very progressive and to me progressive doesn't mean anti racist to me progressive means. I'm a good person. And that's really the way that this culture here has kind of gaslighted and avoided having real conversations about white supremacy and racism. And so when I think about like the breeding ground for hate, I think of, you know, hate and like the KKK and Donald Trump and all these things as like the flower, like this, it's like a symptom of white supremacy and racism, but it's not an isolated entity. And that's not what creates and perpetuates and continues the system of racism that we have. So it's the compost, the water, the soil, the nutrients, all of these things that create the soil and the perfect environment for this flower to grow. And so it's not a blame KKK and a Trump people thing, even though obviously that is like a huge impact, but this is really an everybody problem. And it's a system that we all participate in and perpetuate. And we all have a responsibility for the system and the people who have the most power and the most privilege in our culture in America are the ones that have the most responsibility for changing the culture and the narrative. And unfortunately, that's not what has been happening. And I think the problem is that the most often, more than not, the people who experience marginalization and the violence and the oppression and all of these things are the ones who have the least power and are impacted the worst by the systems and we're the ones that are always being expected and asked to change these systems and so i don't know if you have the slide pulled up or if you can see it but i have this pyramid where at the top of it it says the white body is the supreme being by which all other bodies shall be judged. And this is a quote by Resma Menekum. And basically that's like in, in this picture, the image that is like, it's like, it's kind of hard to see, but it's very overt for people of color and for white people. It's kind of like the air you breathe. It's there, but you don't really see it. But that's really what our whole culture is based off of. Everybody is judged based on the standard of whiteness. And that is like the supreme, the supreme entity. So, and then in our culture, we have, you know, on the top, uh, if you're looking, if you can put on the second slide, there's like the socially acceptable in our culture forms of racism. And then at the bottom, there's things that our culture, a lot of people, but not everyone sees as less culturally acceptable. So like less culturally acceptable would be like KKK, racial slurs, hate crimes, like most liberals or Democrats or like people who think about racism, that's what they think of. But they don't generally think about their, the way that they contribute to the system of racism and the way that they are accountable. And so that part is what we would consider the socially acceptable forms of racism, centering white feelings and guilt over the actual harm of the person of color. And you know, making the individual the problem versus in protecting the institution and the oppressor. Celebrating racist holidays, you know, living in all white neighborhoods, blue, li blue lives matter, 
white people and police officers seeing themselves as victims of brutality by marginalized folks and using that as a way to gaslight the experiences of people of color, having Eurocentric curriculums, being afraid of people of color, anti-immigration policies, all of these things. These are like socially acceptable forms of racism in our country. And then, you know, towards the bottom, we have like the paternalism that happens. And you see this a lot in white organizations of like, we know what's best for you. So we have white people in leadership roles that are making all the decisions. They have all the resources and the money and the power, and then they're choosing where those resources go and how they're spent and how, you know, like how we help the black people and, and all of this type of stuff. But you don't so often see, you know, like the people in the position of power being people of color that are able to make those kind of um, decisions. And then as we go down towards less acceptable, which is still pretty acceptable in our culture, but racist policies, the school to, to prison pipeline, mass incarceration, racial, racial profiling, redlining, all of these things. That's what our culture mostly is seeing as, the, oh, that's what racism is. I'm not like that. I'm a good person. And I think until we're able to see all of the ways that our culture is, is racist and is built on racism, we're not really going to be able to change it because we don't see our responsibility and we don't see the ways that we perpetuate it. Thank you so much. And I, I just heard that um, I think that Representative Hernandez has to go vote very soon. Uh, so I have a couple of questions in the chat, but the, I want to ask one of my own um, because whenever you leave, hopefully you'll come back, but we don't know, we don't know how long that will take. Uh, so I have a question, which is where, so where do we go from here? It's a question I'm going to ask again later to all of us, but I'm going to ask it to you right now, uh, Representative Hernandez. Hi, sorry. Okay. So you're asking me, where do we go from here as far as policy, pushing policy, or I just want to make sure I'm understanding the question. In, in general, I mean, if we're going to tear down a system that is really designed uh, to promote hate, as far as I'm concerned, uh, then how are we going to do that? I, some of it's going to be policy, but some of it's on all of us too, that beyond policy and beyond our le state legislatures, yeah. but you know, how, how do we, what do we do? Yeah, well, I think first and foremost, as um, Representative Jones has already stated, you know, we have to hold our elected officials accountable. I think that's where it starts. I think a lot of people don't realize the power a lot of elected officials have. Um, when they tell you that there's nothing they can do, they're lying to you because that is actually very, very much a lie. <laughs> um, there's a lot we could do, even in the minority, a lot of things you can do to create change. And I think what, where we go next from here is really, and I, I will say, and I'll be very honest, is, you know, racism didn't just start when, when Trump was elected. I mean, people have been racist forever. Um, we, we have only emboldened them, and these are people that have come out of the woodworks now and feel empowered to do what they do. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying here, um, and I don't want anyone to get the impression that I, I only feel that this has happened on, you know, after the election because I think we would be lying to people if we said that. I think what we need to do moving forward is one, holding elected officials accountable, two, continuing to push for the policies that you wanna see change. Again, it may sometimes take more than one try and it's okay if it takes more than one try, but if you can eventually get something and bring change to your community, that's what matters. And that's what's important. Whether it takes one year or two years and sometimes even more, you have to continue pushing for what you believe in and stand strong and not, and not compromise your values as a person just to please others. And I think that's one very important thing here is in politics, sometimes it's very, you get the good, the bad and the ugly, it's difficult. Um, you try your best to, to do the best, your, your best job ever, but there are always going to be people that are not going to be pleased with what you do. And you have to be okay with that. You have to be willing to continue fighting for what you believe in. And sometimes the way I measure things is if both sides are pissed off at you, then it's okay. Then you're not favoring one. And it, it, you know, that's kind of how I measure things sometimes. If there's one policy issue, whether it's my anti-Semitism bill or Holocaust education or pushing pushing for um, uh, to end police brutality. At the end of the day, if both sides are not completely 100% on board with your with your bill, then that's kind of okay. That should be where you want to be. You don't want to be 
yes on one side completely and no completely on the other. You have to be willing to, to work with people. And that's one of the things is that I think is very important when we move forward and, and talk about what, what the future looks like and what it should look like is we have to be willing to work with people. You just have to. Um, you know, we, we have to also work with the children. I know Camila has talked about the youth group she, she runs. It is so important for us to talk, to talk to the youth and get them when they're young, because once you're, you're older, it's very hard to change your ways, very hard to train someone on how to be, you know, a, a leader and a strong advocate when they're, when they're much older and already out doing their own things. When they're young, it's when it's important. So I would encourage everyone who's here um, to continue reaching out to the youth, continue doing what you're doing because we can't do it alone. And it's not gonna happen overnight. It's going to take time. And, and you know, where we go from here is really what, what we want, what we wanna see in the future, what we want it to be. And it's going to be dependent on a lot of us and what we do as individuals. Thank you. I'm gonna ask all of you that question a little bit later. I was just concerned that we might not get that from Alma before she left. Yeah, uh, before and I will be back. Um, I do, we are in caucus right now and there are a few bills that are very important that I need to be in there for. So I will connect with you all in a bit. Okay, all right, okay. I'll see you soon. Okay, so I, I am gonna ask um, a couple of these questions if it's all right. And we don't all have to answer all of them, but if you wanna answer them, you can just like raise your hand, like to like actual hand uh, and, uh, and let me know and I will, uh, or you can just unmute yourself and, and talk for the panelists. I, again, if you're in the chat, um, if you're in the participants, you're an attendee, feel free to ask questions in the Q and A. We do have the chat turned off for security reasons. Uh, we can put things in the chat for you to see, but that's that's all. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start with our first question that came in so that I can try to make my way down this list. I've, I've looked them over to see if any of them uh, overlap, but they don't really. Uh, so uh, this one is Dr. Bill Honigman um, and from California, and he says uh, Medicare for all would allow for public prioritization in allocation of resources to regional areas of need, including inner city and rural communities most impacted by COVID-19 and what we can expect in pandemics to come due to global temperature rise. Given that the social detriments of health so greatly affect especially communities of color, why is it, do you think, that so many politicians who were elected to represent these communities are not advocating more strongly for this very needed reform and the definitive move to healthcare justice? I think that's a great question. I have my own thoughts, but I'm gonna let you guys, anyone who wants to answer it, let me know. So I think uh, that's a, it's a loaded question and I might not answer it all in totality because I'm sure that we'll be here a very long time. Um, uh, trying to, to deal with deal with that. Yeah, let's be extremely clear about something. Um, first, COVID-19, um, we're not just seeing healthcare disparity or healthcare injustice right now when it comes to the, the, the disparity of, of the spread of healthcare within the black and brown community. Uh, COVID is just shining a light on uh, healthcare injustice that has been uh, around for years. Right now, what we are what we are seeing in the re well, let me go back. The reason why most will not support Medicare for all in, in, in the form that we want it to is because who is who who's pulling the string uh, of those individuals. So you're not going to find them to uh, to do that because you mean the insurance lobby is a very large uh, firm of individuals who want to ensure that that does not occur. So let's just put that out there. But to taking it a step further, yeah, we currently what we are seeing right now is a uh, is a nation who have become hypocrites to a situation who call uh, who many have uh, touted us for being socialists, but we just literally uh, just had a an entire um, um, uh, stimulus package that has gone out to help people. And trust me, you know, people will understand that when you talk about Medicare for all, and when you talk about giving, uh, when, you, when we talk about giving uh, Americans dollars per month to be able to to survive, all of this is a is, is a boost to our economy to ensure that you, if you have healthy people, healthy people are going to spend money, 
And that's the one thing that we as a country that we are missing that 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 we're missing the concept on because individuals are beholden to 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 lobbyists who uh, who fund campaigns and these various things, and so they don't make the they they make the decisions based off that and not on based off of need. And right now, when we're dealing with the healthcare disparities of black and brown individuals, I mean, we would be much better off if we would just get to a place to where we would give, where we would, in, in Florida, expand Medicaid to make sure that people can go get check, uh, checkup, to make sure individuals are not using the emergency room as um, um, for uh, for doctor's appointments, clogging our emergency, emergency uh, room uh, rooms up. And so this is a larger conversation, and I would love to continue continue just going on on my frustrations that I've sat on the health care committee for eight years dealing with these various these, this various issue. But we no one would listen right now because they believe that it will, uh, they believe uh, they're too beholden to individuals um, in the system um, that disagree with us when it comes to making sure that everyone has access to health care. Uh, thank you, and I I could also go on and on about it, uh, but I I think that we you know here in Vermont we have Act 48 on the books, which is a single payer system that we have not funded, uh, and so it doesn't exist. Uh, and we I think that the organization that uh, both me and I are very interactive with, which is uh, Rights and Democracy. In fact, Mia is on the board, is working on a new version of Act 48 that kind of addresses some of the concerns people have. But I do think COVID has sort of exposed how big of a problem it is that we don't all have access to healthcare. Uh, and I, and I, you know, I think another problem because here there isn't as much big money funding necessarily into our state legislature. But I think another problem is that we are. Not, if you're a person with lived experience and you go advocate or even or even are allowed to testify in a committee. You are not given your experience, your story, and your information is not given the same deference as a lobbyist or as uh, or as uh, someone considered an expert who has uh, who who may have a different opinion. There's a lot of ability to only hear from certain people, and so I sort of advocate or or think it's important to have a uh, to have some sort of test. I. I we, we're jokingly calling it the Christie test for Code Representative Kevin Christie, uh, where, you know, did we have at least this many people testify who have lived experience? Did we give the same deference to the things they said as we do, as we do to lobbyists or quote unquote experts? Like, so sort of having some of that discussion, because I do think that that problem also plays out with uh, economic justice issues, with racial justice issues, with opioid issues, in my experience, uh, with uh, with uh, indigenous rights issues. Uh, I think that, that is, that's huge too, as well. Uh, I am gonna, if anybody else wants to answer that question, we have more questions coming in. I could go to the next one, uh, but let me know if you are wanting to answer that as well. All right, so as we're transitioning, I just wanna let people know who are watching that we do have a donation link. I am running for office, I'm running for Lieutenant Governor and I would love it if, you're, if you'd like to donate. We also can put in the chat, which you guys can grab. Uh, if, I don't know if, if Representative Jones has a link that he'd like to share. Yeah. Jacob has it. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's just www.chevronjones.com. Okay, so we'll get that. On Twitter, they can follow me on Twitter also, Brenda, at Chevron Jones. Okay, okay, so we'll put we'll put all that in as well. So, but please do donate. Raising money in the time of COVID is really hard. So both Chevron and I are running for office right now, and we do need you to donate, even if it's like five dollars. It makes a huge difference, and it's also a little morale boost. So we would love that. Uh, so please, please, we sometimes we do a combined donation link. We didn't have time for that this go round. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna take up the next question. The next, I'm gonna resolve this one. Uh, done. Okay. Uh, so the next question um, is uh, running for office. This is from Sebastian Fuentes, who is also a huge part of rights and democracy, and who uh, thanks for joining us, Sebastian. Uh, so he says running for office as a member of a minority is hard to do in Vermont and as it is in New Hampshire, but at the same time, we're severely underrepresented. Does anyone have any recommendations about how to address that? Because both do need to happen. I 
Anyone? Okay. I think, I mean, I don't feel like I have a full answer to that question, but I think that it's important. I think that it's really hard for minorities to run in Vermont and New Hampshire because there's such a high level of violence and racism and, and silencing of people of color voices. And I think to really be able to do that in a safe way, we obviously need more people to be able to do that together so that there's more people in there supporting each other. Because once you get into office, you're then also in front of a large number of people who are racist, who don't have your back and who don't support you as you know some of the other POCs who ran and got in have experienced. And we also need more white folks who are running for office or who are in there to really show up in not afraid ways that can step into place to really fight white supremacy and help to protect so that people of color aren't getting into these positions where they're having to deal with that kind of violence on their own. Uh, I'm gonna I'm say something. Uh, although I'm not in, uh, you know, Vermont, but I would just say that, you know, me being an underdog, meaning no support, um, I took out incumbents. You just got to trust the process. And like uh, Amber said, organize the people who want change. And you will be surprised on how many of those minorities that deep down inside won't change, but they looking for that person to step up. So don't ever be afraid to step up. Because a lot of times in this space, I have been alone fighting. And then people was like, we behind you. And I'm like, if you behind me, we got to build this army. So just, just think about that. Yeah, I want to add to, uh, to that, that if you are supporting people who are running for office, you get behind them, do, do the work too, because nobody wins on their own. And, and I think we've seen that in progressives not making it to be the nominee necessarily in some of our higher offices, they don't win on their own. So I think on that same front, it's on all of us, whether or not we're running for office to step up in whatever way we can. Maybe it's writing postcards 15 minutes a day. Maybe it's, you know, 15 minutes once a week that you can make some texts or phone calls. You know, that's okay if that's what you got, but give it because it really does take, it, it, we are, if we're gonna, if we're gonna build together instead of there being leaders and everyone else, I, I, I personally think we have to build together. So if we're going to build together, that means you have to join when people are willing to step up and willing to put themselves out there, especially more marginalized folks. I mean, as a low income single mom, you, when I put myself out there, it can be very lonely at times. I feel if, I'm in a very awkward place where, where I kind of don't belong and, or the system has created a system where I don't really belong. And so, you know, it, it means a lot when you give 15 minutes. And it makes it a lot easier because it, it does take all of us together to make that change. So I, that, I know that wasn't exactly the question, but I want to say that I want to flip it a little and say that it's not just on you if you're going to run for office. It really is on everybody else to join you. And we, we have to talk about that side as well because it's, it's hard to continuously ask Mia sometimes. It's hard to, keep, to be like, would you be willing to speak for me? Would you be willing to, if that's not easy because if you're a more marginalized candidate, you hear no more often than you do yes from, um, from people. They're, people are having, you know, the people I know have hard lives. And so they don't have a lot of time. Their lives are hard. And so everybody who gives 15 minutes matters a lot. So, so do that as well. I don't know if, does anybody else want to jump in there? So my next question uh, is, resolving them as I go, is from Michelle Boss Loon, who's also actually running for office in uh, the Putney Dummerston. I think it's Wyndham Four. I hope I'm right. Uh, and uh, she is actually joining us for a panel next week on mental health. Uh, she is asking, do you have ideas about legislation or other steps that could work against the rise of hate and work towards healing divisions in communities uh, overall in the US, also in Vermont, but ad addressing it across the country, she's also fine with. So 
Okay. Uh, so I work with a lot of families across the country to, you know, some profile, high profile cases to no profile cases. And as a legislative, I would say you have to be sympathetic to, you know, how they are feeling. A lot of times they're not civically engaged in a lot of stuff. So just pretty much being sympathetic, thinking about them uplifting their loved one's name, um, just showing that you care, comfort. Also, um, to legislation that I see is needed across the country is uh, trauma help. You know, implementing trauma access to trauma care in schools, in the communities, because this stuff is triggering, triggering, especially for people of color and people who have been impacted by hate, whether it's racial hate, police hate, or just hate in their own community by somebody that look like them. So that'll be just some legislation that I would love to see across the country. I would love um, elected officials to be more um, open to embracing these families who are, who are losing people. You know, I, 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 I'm speaking about Mike Brown so much because I've been in contact with his family these last past five years. The country has turned their back on this family. Everybody hands up, don't shoot. But on his birthday, not too many people took to call out Wesley Bell. Not too many people go down to Ferguson. Not too many people check on his father or check on his sisters. We have to be sympathetic. And that's how you heal the community when you show that you care. And you know, to add to what Camila just uh, made mention of, uh, you know, even when it comes to legislation, uh, Martin Luther King said something. He's, uh, it's a longer quote, but he in, 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 in so many words, he said, you can't legislate morality, you have to change hearts first. And, and I don't care how much any of us fight. Um, I don't care how hard we put our energy in, 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 even in the legislation that we put forth. I mean, until we start attacking the system, until we start attacking things like the, the school to prison pipeline in a real way, not this uh, hands-on, hands-off type thing. Until, until we start focusing on really putting people in positions of power that matches the legislation that we're filing, these would be the same questions that we continue to ask for the next years, next years to come. Um, because it's a, it's, I, I'm, I'm just gonna say it. What we're dealing with right now is a sickness. Um, we're dealing with a, a real sickness within the, within this country. Um, and and it is the sad part about it is what we're seeing as of, of what's happening with our even with our black men when it comes to police and how they're being treated. Um, and this is a fight that we even with cameras now, it's a fight that we're constantly seeing. What bill am I gonna file to deal with that? What bill do I put forth? Even if I put forth a bill that deals with, and I, I and I know that Representative um, Hernandez, uh, she made mention of it. I can put all the bills I want about training, right? Which I believe is necessary. Don't get me wrong. I mean, but I was trained as a teacher, but when I got in that classroom, training went out the window because it just it, it just on the job training. When I'm in the classroom, it don't work like that, right? And so, how do we make sure that the people who got the gun and behind the badge make sure that that they don't get there in the first place. That's what we have to begin doing. And until that begins to happen, we're gonna continue having these conversations. I'm behind with y'all. I'm sick of having these conversations. I'm sick of talking about uh, how we can stop um, uh, racism. And I can tell you this, I, I, just because I'm sick and tired don't mean I'm, I'm gonna stop fighting for it. Cause I go in my grave fighting for it. But I, I'll be damned if I, if I die not let I, I'll be damned if I die, and the first thing that I will I will say on my deathbed is that I didn't fight hard enough. You'll never hear that come out of my mouth. Yeah, because as long as I got we got people like you all who are here, I believe that we're we're on our way to something, and we just got to we just have to continue to build the, build the coalition to bring people along with us, and we can't be scared to do it. 
we can't be we can't be scared to bring people along on these fights. And I go back to what I said in the beginning that I mean, these fights that we have, and yeah, you, know, you got to be willing to have people in the fox go with you and say, hey, listen, when I throw this grenade, we about to both go out here together. I don't need you to stand in the foxhole uh, while while I'm outside running. If we die while we out there, cool, we die with a purpose while we're out there. And but that's the type of individuals that we need to do it. And legislation is one thing, but action is another. I just wanted to chime in and say, you know, until like there's even recognition that 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 there's racism even in right. our governments and in our justice system to begin with, we, we we don't even label things that are clearly hate crimes, hate crimes. We don't have anything in system to protect our brothers and sisters who are running for, for office, who are being subjected to to hate speech and who are being harassed in that manner and and so until we can even even recognize and have those people who are in power say yes that was racism in the first place that that was a hate crime that that was you know even bias they're they're afraid of until they can even just recognize that in in the system itself we'll we'll still keep having these conversations and we'll still keep looking for legislation um and, and that's just all it is. And I also just want to say that we that we also have to, another reason we all have to jump in all the time is because we do have to give people who are tired the break for a second. Like if we're not all fighting together, then, then we're exhausting the few people that are willing to fight. And I agree 100%. I mean, one of the most tragic things to me, uh, and when I wrote our my piece, maybe we can find it, put it in the chat so you guys can grab it, uh, about uh, about our Attorney General's decision uh, about Kaya Morris, I, I, one of the things I, I noted was how come we didn't, in, in, even if we had to make that decision, how come it didn't come with, I believe it's a bill in Indiana, I'd have to look now back at the, at the article, at the commentary, but how come it didn't come with, this is the legislation we need in order to be, for me to have been able to prosecute that? And I'll tell you why, because we are not examining our own implicit bias. And when we are not standing up as allies, we, it's because we, didn't, we are not willing to examine. I, if, if I'm sitting here, I am not preaching. I have made my own set of mistakes. I have not been perfect throughout my life. I have done things wrong on racial justice and other issues. And I just, any white person that says that they haven't is not examining themselves because it's just not okay to not, to not acknowledge that. We have to acknowledge it. And that's the first step to us even acknowledging that there is racism. And then on top of that, to acknowledge that the system itself is really designed in such a flawed way to hurt the people who have the least and to really be a racist system. And it's not the system's fault, it's people's fault. So I'll come back to that thing I say all the time, which is that it's a people made problem and people made problems can be people fixed. And that's on all of us to make, to do that. So, uh, so we are the people, all of us that need to fix them, not just our elected officials. Uh, and I see that James Lees, I do not know how to say your last name, has, has your uh, hand raised and I can't, we're not gonna bring you up, but you can type into the Q and A and we will answer your question. So uh, I'm gonna ask the next question. I really am appreciating this incredible discussion. Uh, I, we did that, okay. Mia, this is also from Michelle. Uh, I'm a Vermont teacher who is, who, when is the ethnic studies curriculum supposed to be implemented in Vermont classrooms? Uh, she hasn't seen anything yet. US history is still very uh, Eurocentric, not inclusive at all in terms of what she's seen in local schools yet. Well, um, the passing of Act One was really mostly um, geared to um, addressing the standards. So the the work group main action under Act One is addressing standards, which is different than curriculum. Even though we all would like to eventually um, get to the curriculum, there, the coalition itself is working on 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 coalition the co on curriculum. Um, on the curriculum aspect of it. 
In fact, today we just had like a teach-in that was that was um, was um, hosted by one of our one of our members on Ramadan and Eid. And so we're we're actually taking this opportunity right now while we're kind of doing this virtual schooling to try to find ways to incorporate some of this curriculum digitally because I know that there's a need right now. So so that's that's it's on its way. Um, but just to be clear, most of the, the 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 Act One is to address the standards. I hope that answered your question. I think it, I think that was a great answer, and I I just want to let people know, folks know that we have terrible internet in Vermont, so you we have been able to hear everything you said have said, Mia, but. When you hear the crackling, like literally, I live in the country and I sometimes I'm talking and you can hear my voice, but my mouth isn't moving or it's moving at the wrong speed. There's really nothing we can do about it because we haven't made the investment in broadband, which is another inequity. <laughs> so, uh, so that's again, people made problem that could have been people fixed and it's harming right now it's harming the people in rural communities period and most disproportionately low-income communities and people and most disproportionately people of color in our state. So uh, that's another issue that I thought I'd bring up uh, while, while we're here. So uh, the next one is from uh, Ellie Klein, or maybe, uh, and the question is, working against hate must start must start working with very young children and helping them to understand about kindness and continuing to cultivate cultivating that as they grow and in the schools as many have said it is putting good people in positions of power including as teachers from as long as i have memories around age four i was i was the target of anti-semitism in my neighborhood and then in elementary school when teachers covertly took punitive action against me as the only jewish child so at an early age, I learned about and tried to stand up for others who were marginalized and also kudos to Rep Hernandez. So uh, I want to just say that, uh, yes, I feel like there's been a, so I, so I just, as a Jewish woman, I have, uh, I feel like I've experienced an undertone of anti-Semitism and it's like the hate I'm not allowed to talk about. Uh, and and I, and it, you know, jokes about, you know, things like, um, you know, she jewed, she jewed, or he jewed me out of my money, those kind of things that I, that, right. And that I heard throughout my entire life and people were like, oh, but it's just a joke. It's just funny. And there was no recognition that that was a form of, uh, of anti-Semitism and no recognition that uh, there was a huge problem, for example, in, uh, in World War II, where the people who got out were the people who had resources to get out. So understanding also that there that there is a real fear that relies on every generation has had to leave um, until my father's generation, and and so there we have to be prepared to leave. That's that's something that has had to happen over and over and over again as part of Jewish people's history. And so, and there's, and I, I mean, all kinds of things like that. And I think it was an undertone that was always accepted as okay. And so, while I didn't necessarily know at all times that it was anti-Semitism, even as a young person at, who grew up in a house who was, whose grandmother, my grandmother came here uh, escaping Hitler and, uh, and I had, tons of education about my my grandfather wrote the screenplay to roots so i had tons of education growing up about uh, about that you i was basically told you stand up when you see injustice you stand up and that was what i learned but i didn't really understand that injustice for myself and so i just wanted to address that and say that i i the recognizing that one has been the target of anti-semitism in and of itself is very powerful to me, um, because I don't even think I recognized it until I got older, and uh, and some very well-meaning friends who didn't understand that they were that those jokes were not okay, and uh, and I was not brave enough to stand up, and nor should I have had to be. So we should have had teachers say hearing that and saying something. People, other other people should have. So. Um, I, and I don't know what the solution is because it, it continues to be something that people are like, oh, we can't talk about that kind of hate. 
So, uh, so it's, I, I do think that there's this strange problem in it. And so I'll let others also, I don't know if anyone else has anything to say about that, but as I just wanted to, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I would say that it's, it's, it's very important that you start earlier, sooner than later, because you will be surprised on how even third graders know about hate. And it's not because it's always taught at home. It's because of what they are seeing on social media. You know, I had um, young people think, you know, that were um, Caucasian young people they were okay with yelling out blue lives matter. And then I had young people who are black that will say black lives matter. So it began to come like this, this, uh, this like racial war. And we had to explain what black lives matter really meant and what saying blue lives matter really truly means. And I think that once you give young kids that education and do it in an educational form, like for me, I used to do it with writing topics and then we would discuss it. You know, we didn't just have to wait until Black History Month to talk about Black History Month or Native American Month. We talked about it just in a writing prompt. So I will say, keep um, talking about uh, racist hate among young people because young people, if we get it now, I think that we will, young people will grow up to start a them and not be like, you know, some of, some of our um, ancestors. I agree with that. And I think another thing too is like, you know, like we don't wait until our kids are like seven or eight years old to teach them how to speak or to like start talking to them. We don't wait until they're like eight years old to like put a pink shirt on them and say, oh, this is a girl, you know, like this, this is a learned behavior. And it starts from the time that our children come into the world. And it's like, also, I feel like not really about kindness, but always disrupting the system. Like, for example, I have a two-year-old, a three-year-old and an eight-year-old and, and I'm always acknowledging and disrupting so if I was reading a book about Rosa Parks and it said Rosa Parks had to sit in the back of the bus because she was black I'll stop there and say whoa that's not right Rosa Parks didn't have to sit in the back of the bus because she was black she had to sit in the back of the bus because the system of white supremacy of people that created this rule like there's nothing wrong with her skin color or creating this like there's something wrong with you because you're black and that's the problem so it's like there's all these little ways that we're constantly disrupting it, but you really need teachers and, and leaders and people who are very, very aware of the system, like in positions where they can be calling it out and in positions to like teach our children and, and to be doing that kind of work. Absolutely. I'm with Amber on that. You know, language matters so much and teaching it from the beginning um, I was so honored enough to be part of I Am Vermont too through the Root Social Justice here in Vermont. And that basically is points out the implicit, those words that you were talking about, Brenda, that like, can I touch your hair or can I, um, or, you know, those words that deep, that they, they're supposedly innocent or whatever, they're really damaging to our, to our kids. And so, to correct that behavior, like um, Amber said, and the you know consistently um, correct that behavior and recognize that that behavior is harming, harmful. That is harmful to to the, to our kids. So you know, I'm just backing what Camila and Amber says. You know, when we're when we're teaching our kids, we have to teach them in a very purposeful way. And we, and we have to engage them and not be afraid of, of these discussions. And also not saying that, you know, I don't see color and some of these other things, like, of course we see color, of course we see these things, but what, do, and how, how that, and, and having those conversations from the beginning, all kids, white kids, black kids, Latino kids, we all need to have those conversations. And Mia, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was, I, I, that was the only thing I was going to say because uh, Camila, Amber, and, uh, and Mia, you all kind of, you not kind of, you wrapped this up the way it needs to be wrapped up. But that last part was real. 
And we have to make sure that we 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 make sure kids do see color. The whole concept when people say, I don't see color, I want you to know I'm black uh, because I want you to know what you're fighting for. Uh, and so you just made, you just said a very good point. Yeah, I very much dislike when people say they don't see color. First of all, of course we do. And second of all, why, why do we not want to see our differences? Our differences are what make us beautiful. And I don't know why we would not want to see that. I think that that's it's hugely problematic. Uh, and I, I really appreciate how that question really turned or that comment really turned into a discussion about this. I, I think that's, and I, as you guys were talking, I was thinking of the story, my son, um, who is more involved with the Jewish community than I am, he's on the board and uh, and, you know, because we also struggle financially, there's like a, we, there are some challenges in, in what, what we've come up against and, and how much I'm able to, uh, you know, fight for him. Although I, I'm known to, to fight for him. I'm definitely known as a mama bear in his, in his communities, but, uh, but he was at school one time and he was called the dirty Jew. And, uh, and he really stood up for himself and I was really proud of him. And some people though told him that, that like, like these are different ways you could have instead of yelling at. And I was like, no, let's hold on a second here, friends. Uh, what is someone supposed to do when they're called, you know, the, the sto a prominent story in our lives uh, is my, my grandmother telling us how in, when, in the rise of Hitler, uh, how one of the things that she recalls poignantly that she recalled poignantly in her life was being called the dirty Jew, Jew in school by her teachers. So when somebody is reflecting that back at him, even if they're just trying to hurt him and it wasn't intended in the way that he, it was felt, it doesn't matter. His, his a reaction that is frustration or anger is an appropriate reaction to that. And standing up for yourself is something that we want to commend. I'm not saying violence, I'm saying, but standing up for yourself. And he didn't do anything violent, but saying out loud, like, no, that is not okay. I mean, I believe there was some, you know, real frustration that came out, but like, why, we, we often use civility and uh, kindness as language that it, those words are often used uh, to shut down or shut up uh, people who are of more marginalized communities who are trying to speak out. And so I, um, Vermont loves the word civil, civility. I'm sure both, anyone here has heard it used a million times. Uh, we love it. Uh, but I, I reject it because it's used to harm people. It's used to quiet people. And so we need to use a different word, respectful. We can be respectful of each other while still speaking up. And speaking up is not being disrespectful. Speaking up, of saying the truth is not being disrespectful. So I challenge us all to use different language. Language does matter. So I challenge us to re reflect on what we're saying out loud because it does matter. And you don't always have to say everything you think. So you can, you can actually re reflect on it and then speak it later. So um, I'm gonna take up the next question. Um, thank you so much, Ellie for that one. And this one is from Katrina Touchstone. And Katrina says, I am appreciative of this forum currently doing during the pandemic. I have noticed more legislation being introduced that will impede our civil liberties. No one is talking about that factor, why not? And I'm not exactly sure which, um, I'm not exactly sure which of those things are Im important. Uh, or which of those things are, are repeating on our civil liberties. So it's hard for me to answer specifically, but if anybody has any thoughts about that, feel free to answer. I, yeah. I don't know how to answer it. I do, Katrina is, uh, she's one of my constituents from my district. Hi Katrina. Um, I, if she can clarify which civil, civil liberties she's, uh, she's speaking of, that would be easier for us to answer. Uh, so Katrina, if you want to, uh, if you want to type in again, oh, Patriotic Act, pa Patriot Act reinstated HR 6666. So the Patriot Act, which is, was just reinstated. Yes, that's a terrible bill. It was not a good bill when it was created. It still continues to be not a good bill. Uh, and it does 
peed on civil liberties. I was not sure which ones you were talking about. I was a little nervous, but, uh, but the, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna let Representative Jones answer that if you want to, since it's your constituent. Well, what, what was the, let me. What, the, the Patriot Act. So it's not from your. But, that, but, that, but that's the Patriot Act is more, that's congressional HR. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with it at all. I'm it's not, not, it's not COVID. It's not COVID related. It's not, it, yeah. they, they just under the wire. So that while we all weren't paying attention, re, re passed it. And it does allow, um, oh gosh, there's so many things that are wrong with it. It does, it does yeah, allow. It's, it's, it's a terrible idea. Yeah, yes. It does allow for like listening in on conversations. It does allow for um, for holding people without cause. There's a lot in there that's not great. Uh, but I think that that's one of the reasons that we all have been like, and my experience on the phones has been like, I can't pay attention to politics right now. I'm so overwhelmed. And they are taking advantage of that. And so we can't do that. We have to pay attention because otherwise the, those kind of things pass. That's, I guess, what I have to say about that. We're not talking about it because uh, we're talking today because we're talking about uh, a, a very specific thing. But but generally, we have to pay attention so that we are fighting up. But I, I didn't even know that was coming until it passed. I did hear that it passed, but I didn't know until it passed. Um, so I am going to resolve that. Okay. Now, how is the economic divide exacerbating hate? Says Jean Hopkins. Any, anyone to take it up? Can you repeat the question? How is the economic divide exacerbating hate? And I'm gonna walk away for one second and close my window because there's people mowing something outside. So hold on, this is COVID times. This is hashtag campaign in place, okay? <laughs> I'll be right back, but go ahead and please take up that question, any one of you. I mean, for back home in Chicago, well, back home in Chicago, I mean, I wouldn't say it was a a real like economic divide with hate. It's just that the, the COVID crisis has put a lot of people at a vulnerable state which will, which means they will do anything to survive. You know, just last night you had somebody rob four police officers right in front of the police station. Like they're trying to um, survive. It's a survival thing right now. And a lot of people are too prideful to stand in line to get, you know, food or too prideful to just reach out and say, I need some help. They're, they're rather take it. So back home where I'm at, the, the crisis, the economic um, crisis that's going on right now, um, it's not really causing uh, racial hate. It's just causing like, oh, I'm going to rob you. I'm going to take from you. I'm going to kill you to get it. And I mean, and just hope that this, this crisis is fixed. I think it also, it also kind of depends on the definition you're using for hate because I think that also if you look at the ways that even with the stip the stimulus checks you know like there's a certain level of income under where you get that full amount but like that amount of money for someone who makes twelve thousand dollars a year versus someone who makes forty thousand dollars a year is going to impact your income very differently and if you make twelve thousand dollars a year a twelve hundred stipend is going to do nothing really and the ways that like, for example, where I've seen like working in some nonprofits that the, the, redis the distribution of wealth and resources is extremely harmful and perpetuates racism because all of the white organizations are the people who have the resources and can quickly enact all of these different programs and collect all of these grant checks and things because of what's happening in COVID. And then you have all these black grassroots organizations or people who are very impacted by COVID that aren't able to access that funding because they don't have admin budgets, they don't have the same 
funding or economic resources that the white organizations do. So if you're already at a disadvantage and then something like this happens, it's going to create an even bigger impact on people with less income. I also think that there's a stigma uh, that's related to poverty in, in the first place. Uh, and so uh, if you keep uh, poor people poor and a disproportionate number of poor people are people of color, then you are adding to what is already hate that we've developed into the system, but also we're adding to that uh, a, a poverty um, stigma. And on top of that, to, to that, that like people who are in economics, in, in serious economic situations, can't be home with their kids all the time. Can't be, you know, we, we can't, I've, I have worked many jobs at times and not been home very much when I've had to do that. And that's, that's not a choice. That's what I have to do. And to, so that my family survives. And, and when we're doing that, then, so for, for people of color, I would say that that's, that that really does, uh, <sighs> play into uh, some of the some of the stigma and racism that exists in the system or or stigma or stereotypes that we that we have created uh, and and we have to be really conscious of that we have to be willing to say I mean I, I don't know the number of times I've heard someone say when I say that we have disproportionate racial disparities we're in the top five for racial disparities in our prison system in Vermont um, one in 14 black men ends up in jail in their lifetime here uh, and uh, and we have an extremely high rate of, um, of traffic stops that are people of color. Like we, we have a serious problem. And, uh, and we've had more police violence in the last two years than we've ever had before uh, here in the state. So uh, when you add to that, that there's, all, that, that, that there's all this stereotype just that belongs to that, and then the disproportionate number of the people that are experiencing poverty and economic divide are people of color, then you're you're basically I mean I th I think just hand in hand it exacerbates hate uh, because those two things are not disconnected they're interconnected so the system itself is promoting it go ahead but but Brendan I think I think we also we've created we've created this system that make it seem as if the uh, that the black community or those, I'm not, 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 not going to say just the black community, those who are economically disadvantaged, we've created this system to where it may make it feel like they always have to continue running to the system for help or the system always requiring them to come to me for help. And, and but let's even take it a step further. It, we've also have created this system to where um, uh, we have a criminal justice system that once they're released from the criminal justice system, that we leave them with nothing. They they come out of the system where they where they're having to figure out. Well, I can't get no job because the job asked me have I ever been incarcerated, and you count me out of your process because of that. And so the only thing I'm able to do to continue to fill the uh, fight and fend for my family, it puts me back, uh, it put me back out on the streets trying to uh, try to find the best way to do what I can. So it seems like it's this is this cycle that's continuously being created, um, uh, whether it's hate, whether it's racism, uh, what, whatever we want to call it. It is a system that has been created that continuously want people to run back to them from help. That goes from nonprofit organizations to the government to everyone. And so it's a, it's a, a systemic problem that, by mind you, to where even within my community, people, they, 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 they themselves think, well, I need this type of help. So therefore, I'm, I, I need to do whatever I need to do to get this type of help. And so it's, it's a problem, and it's it's a, again I go back to the word again. It's a sickness that that mean that that we have. That the question is how do how do we break that? How do we break that type of cycle to where individuals are not doing that? Is not are, are not depending on the government to say, well, you come and be my savior again. I mean, yes, and I want to say as someone that that re that receives those subsidies. Uh, it's also there's a, there it's so sh it's such a shaming experience to do it and the way that the really? process happens it makes you feel awful I mean if you didn't already feel insecure you you 
feel insecure. I talked about this last night at a forum at the Chittenden County Democratic Committee Forum, which is a really hard place actually to, to say that out loud. But I, I said, you know, the hoops that you have to jump through and the way that you're made to feel about not understanding, like you're made to feel like you don't understand your own needs. And uh, if we had more people at the table who had experienced these problems, then we would, we would have different outcomes. There are so many great questions right now and we don't have time for them all. So we are gonna try to, uh, to grab them from the Q&A and ask later, but we're gonna ask one more quick question and then we're gonna have um, everybody just say closing statements. So uh, answer short on this question. I actually think it's a great question. Uh, and it basically uh, is, uh, it starts with economic divide enables, this is Spoon Agave, economic divide enables only some people to enjoy fruits of their labor. The rest suffer and that suffering often ends in antisocial behavior um, because of the frustration of, endless, of endlessness of the situation and the injustice of it all. Since minorities make up much of the people who are struggling, uh, then it becomes synonymous that that be, that that, that the, the the stigma of, be, of that behavior becomes synonymous with minority groups um, in the way that people think. Uh, but it all he also but the question is I've not he's not heard the word capitalism is it off the table with so many legislators present, which I thought was a funny question. I, I'll I'll tell you right now that I will use it. I am a proud democratic socialist and uh, and I think that we need to change our systems so that they do support the people in this country and I and this state and uh, and I have a real problem with uh, with the way that capitalism harms people. So uh, that's the question. I the other part is a comment so either part of that that you want to take up. I think that's true to some extent. I also want to just say that uh, that also, though, people of color are disproportionately sentenced in different different ways and accused, falsely accused, of things that they didn't actually do. So that's the other reason that that becomes a synonymous uh, and, and then that that stigma is, that that stereotype is created. Uh, so I'll let everyone, anyone who wants to take a stab at that before we have closing statements, the capitalism one. I see capitalism as part of white supremacy culture. I don't see those as different things. I see that as part of the same thing. Like there's all these different isms, but they're all white supremacy. And and I agree with the other stuff. I mean, like poor people aren't poor just because they don't work hard or because some random thing. It's a very, very strategic and purposeful system that makes certain people be in certain brackets no matter how hard they work or what they do and the rich people who are really rich don't have money because they work really hard and they're these incredible people that is slave blood money you know that has been stolen from many people and yeah and there's oh and the last thing I was wanting to say was like and like they, we have so many racist laws and policies and it's so, and that's like modern day slavery, right? Like the loitering law, you can get arrested for just hanging around doing nothing. So how many, you know, like brown kids get arrested because they're hanging out with their friends. And then once you're in the system, it's really hard to get out of that system. And so we use laws like that to create certain outcomes for certain communities so that we can have these certain systems happen. It's not just some random like turn of events. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think our system is absolutely, I mean, I think about, I often think about like the panhandling discussion in Brattleboro, um, which everyone knows because I've been very outspoken about, really irritates me because I'm like, if you would like it to stop, then you're going to need to solve the problems of the, with the people who are struggling and pan, and like they're not panhandling, they're trying to survive. What Even if what they're doing is trying to survive with substance use disorder, they're trying to survive. It's literally a survival mechanism for many people, whether it's food or substances, it literally is. And so uh, that's, you're ha you're, if, you, if we're talking about that, we're talking about the wrong, we're asking the wrong question. But I, I am, like I said, a proud democratic socialist. I am not, I, I don't, the capitalist system does bother me quite a lot. 
Uh, so I'm going to give us all, a, I want to thank everyone who's asked questions and that we didn't get to them. I'm very sorry. We tried to get to as many as we could, but this discussion has been so rich. Uh, and I'm sorry that uh, Representative Hernandez is not here to close out, but that was why I asked her <laughs> the question earlier, because I thought I, I've been in the legislature a lot and I've, I, I thought that might happen. Uh, and uh, I want to ask us all to just closing statement and what do you think is an action that people can take, uh, whatever it is? It does not have to be a solid, you know, um, uh, what do you think people need to do right now? What is the most important thing they can do right now to try to, uh, to change, tear down this system? And I'll start with, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll lead you in. So I'll start with Amber. I think that one thing people could do to start is that they could work to acknowledge and start to recognize the way that racism and white supremacy shows up in their own bodies and in their own family and then in their own community and look for the ways that they can first change it in themselves and their families and then how they can be part of shifting that culture in their communities. And if they are people that have access to resources learning how to redistribute some of that to support their communities and the people that are most impacted by these things. Okay, and do you have anything else to say before, just before we close? And I'm really grateful that I got to be here with everyone and I'm still very sad that everyone here doesn't live in Vermont and I can't like learn from everyone because these are like incredible, amazing people and voices. And thank you. Just so folks know, we are gonna we tend to send out this these action steps to people. So we'll grab them later and then send them out. Or maybe uh, hopefully Jacob's taking some notes. Jacob is my field director for those of you that don't know. Uh, and if you haven't donated to both Chevron and myself uh, for our campaigns, please do click on our donation links in the chat and donate. Uh, I'm gonna kick it over to Camila. First, I would like to say thank you guys for uh, having me on this call, um, being so far, far away I'm in Illinois. Um, but just pretty much what Amber was saying, um, get active in your family, in your community, um, love on each other. Um, you don't have to belong to a big organization to make a difference. It can start in your community. It can start in the schools. And also, do not be afraid to challenge the system. Do not be afraid to stand up against those who are supposed to represent you who don't and, and, and challenge them. Protest is, is I'm, 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 I'm game for it. Um, and also, help elected officials out that are doing things for you. Um, submit ideas, policy ideas, ask them how could you help them organize on the ground, host town hall meetings and make them come. They got to come to your town hall meetings. But don't think that you do not have a voice because everybody have a voice regardless of the situation and just keep everyone in prayer who have been impacted by this hate because it is mentally exhausting. It is triggering to see violence every day, all day. Thank you again, and good luck to everyone that's running for office. We need more people like you. Feel free to come to Illinois, because some of them got to go. All right, thank you. Thank you, and uh, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, and yes, get active. I love that, and love on each other. I agree 100%. We, we, there's got to be more love. So uh, I'm going to invite Mia. So yep. I, I'm, I would echo the sentiments of Amber and Camila. I, if, if, if I was in Chicago, I would be right there with you. If I was in Florida, I'd be there right with you. It's about showing, you know, we've got power in numbers. The people are the boss. We are the boss. We keep forgetting that. And I think a lot of people forget that. So we need to get together and demand accountability. Um, and whatever that looks like in your community, um, and so, for example, like right now in our community, we're fighting for change in our police department. It, a lot of people are 
afraid to ask the tough questions and go straight to the top and ask and, and demand what we need is a whole new set of leaders. We need to demand what we want and not be scared of that. Because the more we have each other, we have power. And I just don't want that message to be lost. Like I think a lot of people don't feel like they have power and we are the actual, we, we're, we're power when we're together. So I, I would just say that. You know, thank you. I t we are power when we're together. And I know that firsthand from being together with you in, in, in activist organizations. So I think that that's, uh, I'm always, so oftentimes I feel like there's so much power here if we could all just really get together and use it. Uh, and so I, I really appreciate that. And in Bennington, you know, I, I'm with you on that fight and we have to ask those tough questions or nothing is really gonna change. Uh, and I am now going to kick it to she Representative Chevron Jones. Brenda, first, thank you for put, putting this uh, event together for all of us. Uh, for those of you who are watching, my first suggestion would be to follow Amber, Camila, and Mia on their social medias. And I, I just follow Camila on Twitter a few minutes ago. I think that uh, whenever we follow each other's work, I think that will be the first thing I would say to you. Um, I will also say, you know, Bren Brenda, she did put her, uh, her information for you to give to her campaign. Um, individuals who are not afraid to have tough conversations, that's what you want in office. Um, and it, that's, that's what we need in office. And Camila made it very clear, and uh, uh, Amber and Mia um, has said it. The, the last thing I'll say is this. Um, Rosa Parks didn't give up her seat because her feet was tired. She, she, uh, she didn't give up her seat because she was sick of giving in. And that's how we have to get right about now. We have to get to a point to where we're, we're so sick of giving in and so sick of giving in to the point to where we don't care what the consequences are, we'll go down with the fight doing it. But there is some work that we have to do beforehand. We can't continue to call the system out if we're not willing to go in to do what needs to be done to change it. How do we do that? One, you got to vote. You got to register to vote. And we have a big election coming up November 3rd that will give you the opportunity to be able to do that. Two, you got to complete the census. It is important that you figure that you complete the census to make sure that everyone is counted. And the last thing that I'm going to say is either run for office or support people who support your agenda to run for office. Those are the three things that I believe that needs to happen. Once we get sick of giving in, trust me, the people who are in power, who are making these policies, the only reason why they continue to do it is because they believe that we are too weak to remove them. But I beg to differ. I, be, I, be, I beg to differ because I believe the people are getting stronger as we know it because people are tired and people are tired of giving in. And I think we're right at the point where by any means necessary that we're willing to do what needs to be done to change this and take our democracy back. And I believe the people on here are the fire starters. And remember, it only take a spark to get the fire going. Thank you. And I think we'll try to gather your social media handles um, and we'll send it out to people who attended uh, and put it in our comments in the link so that people can follow all of us uh, because it's really important. And it's, you know what, it's important on social media to like, comment, and share things because that is the only way that the algorithm works. So please do that. I know that that's something that a lot of people don't know how important it is, but it's super important. So spend your time doing it a little bit, not a lot. We don't need, any, we don't need like tons of Facebook warriors. We need people to actually get in the fight. Uh, and, and here's what I wanna say, take all of this advice and get action. You know, I think, uh, uh, I, mean, I think it's Teddy Roosevelt who said when his wife died, how did you survive that? He, he said, I get action. And, uh, and I know that when my nephew died, I, I was, my life was turned upside down and I survived that by getting action, by running for governor at that point. Uh, and 
today I will die on the sword that, that stops people from dying of that disease. And so I think we have to be willing to fight. Everyone who is watching, please fight, fight with us. We will fight with you. I will fight together with you. Let me know what the actions are that you need to, us to be taking in this state across the country. That is work that, that I will do with you. So what I'm gonna ask everybody to do is find one thing that they can do to support a candidate besides donate, donate and find one thing that you can do besides donating to find to support a candidate. I am gonna mimic the, please fill out the census. Vermont has the lowest rate right now. So if you're in Vermont, please fill out the census. And three is going to be, please find an action that you can do in your community. Please find somewhere that you can fight in your community. And if you're in Bennington, fight with Mia on the uh, uh, to change leadership in the police system because it's desperately needed. So I wanna thank all of you attending. I wanna let you know that at 6.30, we have a safer at home happy hour that any of you can join and get to know a little bit more about me. Uh, and, uh, and we are really thrilled that you all came and we are going to be sharing this also with our local access TV stations uh, with everyone that was on here. Please follow us all on our, all of our social media. And, uh, and please continue to have this conversation, no matter how uncomfortable it makes you. It is time for us to do, long past time for us to do more. I wanna thank all of you for coming and attending and having such incredible words. Uh, and I hope that we can have this conversation again in the near future uh, and, and continue to fight together. Thank you.